Well, this morning, uh, like last week, I find myself kind of shocked and jolted by the contrast between the Old Testament lesson and the gospel reading. The Old Testament lesson and the psalm have these beautiful, strong images of God's justice and God's salvation, and the metaphor that Isaiah uses of the parched and thirsty ground becoming springs of water surely, surely speaks to us right now. We long for it, and yet it almost seems too good to be true. But the gospel, on the other hand, is less like a cool drink of water and more like a slap in the face or a, a bucket of water uh, over your head. We hear that not only the denial of healing from Jesus, but it's accompanied by what cannot be other than a racial ethnic slur on his lips. It's, it's shocking, right? Now, it's not my job here this morning to save Jesus right, to, to paint him, uh, to do the blemished corrections and make him, make him really look good. Um, I think this passage is meant to be shocking. There's a reason that it survived to us in this form. Jesus is, is basically hiding out in Gentile territory in the region of Tyre, presumably to get away from the crowds who have not left him with a moment's peace since the feeding of the 5,000. And he's discovered by this woman who begs him to heal her daughter, right? Such a, a moment of, of incredible pathos. And yet he not only denies her the healing, and I think this is the only time he ever flat out denies anyone's request for healing in the gospel, but he refers to her and her people as dogs. So people encountering this, this shocking passage over the millennia have had different explanations for it, and you get to come up with your own explanation um, because there isn't one consensus, right? You get to think about this for yourself. One of the most common older interpretations is that Jesus is just testing her, right? Like he didn't really mean it. He was testing her faith. And that mitigates the shock value, certainly. Because if he did mean it, how could our loving, compassionate, forgiving God deny, not only deny this woman, but call another human being a dog? Well, here's some of the other explanations. Maybe he's drawing on age-old resentments, hostility between the Jews and the Syrophoenicians or the Syrians, right, who had um, ages ago um, occupied Israel. Maybe he is lumping her in with the uh, Gentile elite in that region who are oppressing the Jewish peasants. Maybe he just doesn't think it's her time yet. He specifically says, you know, not, not yet, right? Uh, maybe he feels like his mission is really just to the, the people of Israel. And honestly, really, he's, he's got a way here to, to take a break, right? He's kind of on vacation. <laughs> Go away and stop bothering me. You know, I, I think I can't, I, I can't help but identify with Jesus's exhaustion in this moment, right? Um, after all of the feeding and teaching and healing and miracles, he just wants a minute away. But for whatever reason, and I'm sure there are many more than we could think of, Jesus has what I call a human moment. He withholds love. He withholds healing, withholds grace. He has that sense that maybe there's not quite enough to go around, or maybe just not yet quite enough to go around. And how often do we encounter that in ourselves, in our own lives, right? I know I do almost every day. There's, there's just not enough. There's not enough of me to go around. Honestly, these days, if I were the woman right, and I had come, I had, had overcome all of these barriers to get to this person who was my last hope for my daughter, and I encountered such a slap in the face, such a withholding of life-giving water, grace, from someone who's dying of thirst, I might have just crumbled up right there in despair. I might have just, just walked away and given up. 
But she doesn't do that. This nameless Gentile woman not only accepts the slur, right? but she also cleverly turns the tables on Jesus and reminds him that God's love is always enough and more than enough. Her faith in the fact that God's love, that God's table is big enough for her, even if she has to be a second-class citizen at that table, that God's love is big enough, and Jesus' mission representing that love and that healing and that grace is big enough to include her and every other single human creature on this planet. And in that moment, in that exchange, it seems that Jesus has a change of heart, that Jesus is the one who is transformed by that encounter. Jesus is the one who's reminded that that his mission is bigger than even he can wrap his mind and his heart and his energy around at that moment. Because after that, Jesus takes an unlikely detour (laughs) throughout the rest of the the Gentile region where he is. And and in that region, he feeds and he heals and he teaches. And he goes back to the Decapolis where the next healing story takes place. And when Jesus heals that, that deaf mute man, a little bit more of a familiar healing story to the other healing stories we're used to in the gospel, right? an intimate encounter, touch, But he says an Aramaic word, ephatha, be opened. And I wonder if Jesus is able to use this really unique term with this man at this moment, because he also has just been opened. He's been opened up by his encounter with this Gentile woman who he just wished would get out of his way, just wished would leave him alone. He's been opened up to God's dream, God's vision, God's love, which is, which is bigger than we can ever imagine. And this is a pretty big statement theologically, and I get it if you, if you don't want to go there, that God was changed, right? Jesus is God, and God had a human moment in that moment, and God was changed. I said, this is my interpretation. You, you don't have to accept it. But I think it's also an example of Jesus fully entering into our humanity to be able to be open enough to another human being to be changed in that encounter, to be opened up. So you like, you know, I like to give homework. So this is the homework for this week to think and to pray and to ponder and to talk with one another about the ways in which you might need that opening up, in which you might need to hear the words, Afatha, be opened. Some of you shared with me after the sermon last week that you've been opened up to the reality that this reality, the one we're living in now, these unstable and uncertain times are, are, are in fact reality. And that what we were living in, what we thought was the sort of tranquil illusion of a moderate amount of control over our circumstances and environment, that, that was not, but, but this is. And so we're opened up to the fact that we're not in control. Maybe that's what God is calling you to open up to this week. We have our part to play, yes, but we can't fix this. We can't even ensure safety or sanity for ourselves, much less those around us, much less the world. The events of the last year have opened me up in new ways to the past, to my history and to our shared history and to the marks that that leaves on us, right? We ignore them at our peril. Can we be open to our past and its wounding? Can we be opened up to love? 
And we really, truly, deeply, not just kind of in our heads and check off that box, but at the deepest level, at our core, opened to the reality of God's love for us. That God's love is fierce, that it is deep, that it is effective, and that it is stronger than anything that is around us, all of the chaos and uncertainty surrounding us. Can we be open to that? I have to tell you, I've had the privilege twice in my life to look someone in their eyes when they were at a moment when their life had broken them and they were able to be opened and to say, God loves you. God loves you. And they were able to hear it in a new way, to be opened to that reality. And that changed them, it changed their lives. Can we be opened up? Do we need to be opened up to our neighbors? To our neighbors next door, maybe in our neighborhoods, our communities, like we're organizing ourselves here at Grace now and neighborhood care groups, our neighbors in our country, right? Our neighbors, our global neighbors, right? Those with whom we share this fragile earth, our island home. Can we be open to those who are different from us, who think differently, who act differently, who talk differently, who look differently, who have different backgrounds and histories and experiences of the same reality that we think we're all living in? Can we be open to the fact that God's fierce and deep and unrelenting and effective love is there for them too? Those who we might blame, those who we might even hate, those who we might think of as less than human, as dogs, God's love has to reach to them too. It has to. Can we be open to that, really? Are we being called to open up to hope? I don't know if anyone has um, enjoyed the television series Ted Lasso. I know I've gotten into it lately. And there's apparently a, a British expression that uh, I hadn't encountered before watching this show. That it, they say it's the hope that kills you, right? Hope is dangerous. <laughs> risking hope, right? Because then we might be disappointed. But maybe, just maybe, we're being asked to be open to the possibility that God might be doing something bigger, that God's love, that God's mission, that what God has in mind might be bigger than what our energy or our imagination or even our wildest hopes and prayers might encompass. Something as big and as complex and as terrifyingly beautiful as a night sky from a wilderness place. You can stare into that and hope that God's doing something, that God's got this. And that even as, as we are just as a grain of sand in the midst of that wonder and, and vastness and complexity, that we too have our part. Maybe we're being opened up to that. Because in despair, we can't act, right? It requires some, some hope to act. And so we're, maybe we're being opened up to our part, to our little part in the puzzle the possibility that this vast God of all of the universe might actually be waiting on a grain of sand to shift, to share love, to open up to others, to open up to God. My siblings, may we be opened to the faith of that Syrophoenician woman. It's a desperate faith. It's an unshakable faith that God's love is big enough, that God's love is wide enough 
that God's love is fierce and deep and strong enough for this moment and for all of us. I've said these things to you in the name of our friend and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen.